Good stuff, good stuff, good stuff. Uh, great to be here on this crisp, crisp and clean, no caffeine morning. But we're going to continue in a series that we've been doing here called The Wilderness Life. And we've been looking at the life of John the Baptist because we see that he's a picture of what Christianity is called to be. So uh, we'll dive into all of that and more. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Let's pray together. That's a movie quote. Free coffee for anyone who figures out where that's from. Ghostbusters, I heard it, yes. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Uh, Lord, we need you. Uh, we, don't need, um, we don't need cute. We don't need um, over-stimulating. We need to see the beauty of Jesus. And Lord, as we open your word today, Lord, even if we're touching passages that maybe some have read many times before, or perhaps it's the first time that someone's encountered it, Jesus, would you... Allow us to see you. Would you breathe by your spirit on our time together to illuminate yourself in our midst. Lord, there are so many things that compete for our attention. And none of them compare with you. Would you shine the light on yourself in our midst today that we would see your majesty, beauty, and glory. Call us closer to you. And for some, Lord God, I know today, Call them home. Call them home. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the wilderness life. And uh, again, it's the life of John the Baptist. Uh, today's message, if there's a subtitle, it's going to be called Jesus the Bridegroom. Jesus the Bridegroom. But what I need to do is I need to do a quick backup and, and just give you where we've been, right, since, the, since January. All right. Yes. Yes, Pastor, please give it to us. All right. So very, very quickly, we've seen, um, even if we go back to December, if you haven't been here, it's okay. Um, but John the Baptist is a very extraordinary individual. In fact, if you look at his life and you look at the story of his parents, and even John's birth story being so intertwined with Jesus, I'll give you the summary statement. You, you know, if you want more, I can tell you later. But basically, John's birth with Jesus is a profound statement to Israel that the dramatic departure of God's presence from the land centuries earlier is now being reversed with the birth of Jesus, which will be announced by John. Make sense? In other words, John's life is about the return of the presence of God among the people again. It has been absent for centuries. But now God, or his cloud, as Israel will know it, is on the move, even as the Holy Spirit, what overshadowed Mary, intentional language, the way the cloud left, the cloud is returning. So John's life is about that. Okay? And so we looked at a few things. So after that you know, dramatic beginning, then John disappears for a few decades, right, into the wilderness. Yes, it's a desolate place. It's a barren place. But John's life is a miracle because he's a life out of a desolate, uninhabitable place. When all of us give our lives to Jesus, that's, that's all our story. We're all a miracle. I'm a life out of a dead place. Just like John was, you know, his mom Elizabeth, her womb was old, it was done. There was no life in it. But God put life supernaturally and said, even death itself is not enough to overpower me. I have authority over death and I'm bringing life from death. Okay. And so John, in, he gets formed in this desolate place and it's a statement. I can go to where there seems like there's nothing and God can shape me there because he's enough all by himself. All right. Second time we saw that um, Gabriel, the angel, when he spoke about John, and then when Jesus spoke about John, they both quoted the book of Malachi or the Italian prophet Malachi. <laughs> Which actually is not a prophet. It, the, the word Malachi means messenger, but just having some fun, right? You know, Malachi, he, he tells the priest, right, the whole book is a rebuke of the priesthood. You haven't been good to the father. You've gone against the family. Right, and so, but really, when you read the book, it's like, like I don't even want to be a fly on the wall, right? Like, wow, like he, the, the Lord's like, you priests, you profane my name. Like, you, you sneer at even making sacrifices, and then you put all the sick and diseased animals on the altar. Like, that's your statement about me. That's what I'm worthy of? I'm worthy of that type of effort and sacrifice? Like, you're intentionally sinning against me. And then even when people come to you and they want to know the, the, the word of God, you don't even know it. Don't you understand that if you're a priest, you're a messenger? And when people come to you, get the message, they, why would they even come to you? You've become a reproach in the sight of the people. Oh, and by the way, you can't even be faithful to your own wives. 
And so it's this whole book, like, rebuking the priesthood. And so then he says, but I'm going to send a messenger. And so what he's saying is he's referring to John the Baptist. And he's saying John's going to be a messenger, which means John's a priest, because priests are messengers. And what he's saying is John's going to be a picture of the priesthood that I'm worthy of. They don't actually have a priest that what loves me and that seeks me and that even doesn't need to be seen. He'll be content living in the wilderness, right? Yes. Okay. So we saw that. Then we saw John had a, he was baptized in the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And so he grew and he had character and people were out, you know, Jesus says, what did you go out to see? Right? And so when people looked at John's life, they're like, what? And he's like, He said, what? And he's like, no, no, no. That's what I'm talking about. Bunch of owls in this place. All right. And then we saw that John was what? Hidden in the wilderness. All right. But he was somebody who was moved by the word of God so that when he spoke, he was a moved messenger. A messenger, pardon me. And moved messengers moved people. Right. With the word of God. And then last week, well, obviously, we did the thing within the waters and the tub coming up. Right. The, the earth was formless and void. Right. All the waters were over it, but God didn't create the earth to be formless and void. He actually created it to be inhabited. And how many know that you and I were not created to be void? We weren't created to be desolate. We were created to be inhabited by the very spirit of God. Okay? Which is why John's life is so awesome. It's all about the return of God's presence. So with all that context being done, and we're all good, um, with a little Pastor Charles from Rwanda sprinkled in between, Let's go to John chapter 3, and this is where I want to finish up our series uh, this Sunday and next Sunday. It's in this passage, which is so rich with imagery. And the more I read about John the Baptist, the more I am just impressed and blown away by his ability to see with clarity what was happening in the nation. So hopefully you'll be impressed a little bit today too. But we're going to establish some things. We have a little illustration. We're going to walk away with three statements for us today. John 3, chapter 26, this is the gospel of John. And it says, and they, these are John's disciples, the Baptists, came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he, being Jesus, who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you testified, behold, he, he's baptizing now, and all are coming to him. In other words, we're losing customers. (laughs) Like, everyone's going to him. And we're with you, and everyone used to be coming to you, but now they're all going to him. And what do you got to say about that? Because we're with you, we're not with him, and we're where where the action was, but now the action has pivoted. Sometimes disciples can be bandwagon, you know what I'm saying? All right, so what does he say? John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Now, verse 29, this is going to be our key passage for today. He who, what, has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which is what John essentially is saying, that's who I am. He says, who stands and hears him, man, he rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. There's a whole message in that. That's next week. Stop it. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase. And now, I must decrease. We had a moment and where the light was shining on us. And that's cool. But the only reason we had that moment is because we were faithful. But all of our life has been about getting to this moment where the whole nation begins to shift towards him. My joy is complete. Not just because I've done my assignment. But I can hear him rejoicing that he's with the people That's what my life is about. And so I'm happy and I'm content. The attention didn't get me. It's not what defined me. It's my love for the man. Okay? And so here we go. So this is John, and he just lands. He just drops the term bridegroom, which for us, you might be looking at it and go, okay, well, that's a weird word or that's different. But what I want to do is kind of break it down a little bit because this is... This is two chapters after John dropped another term. So I want to put these two terms together so we can appreciate it. And so, so here it is. In, in John 1.29, just to remind us of the term that John used for Jesus before, it says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, everyone say it with me, the Amen. of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
I did not know him, but he who sent me, this is verse 33, to baptize with water and said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John, you're baptizing in water, he's going to baptize in the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. All right? Why is this important? I want to put these two terms together. The first time, he says to Jesus, two chapters earlier, this, behold the Lamb. He points to a man. I've, I've said it before, but let's bring it home even clearer. You have to understand for Israel, there are, for centuries and centuries and now thousand plus years, their whole entire, their whole identity as a people is around this whole sacrificial system that, that, that is tied to the presence of God. And it's all about dealing with the weight of sin. So there are animals that are, that, are, that are sacrificed. You have morning sacrifice, evening sacrifice. You've got blood in the morning, blood in the evening. Then you've got particular festivals and times, Passover, the Day of Atonement. I mean, there, these animals are getting killed all the time. And Passover, it was so intense when people would bring their lambs into the courtyard that in the time of Jesus, there were three different shifts or three services, if you will, where they came in and all the lambs were killed. And it was said that the blood got so high by one of the historians, at times it was said to be up to the knee of the priests. So this is their whole system. For centuries and centuries and centuries, and from you know, the writings of Moses from Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, it's all centered around Leviticus and the whole system. And what John is saying is like everything that Moses wrote about can be summed up in one man. There he is. He's the lamb. It's, it's revolutionary. These guys are all animal, animal. Now, wait a minute. You're telling me that in a man is the entire sacrificial system? Yes, that's what I'm saying. John saw stuff that nobody else saw. It's a very profound statement. I, I need us to feel the weight of that. So he says that, but now he's like, now he's the bridegroom. So before I go any further, what I want to say is that here's the fruit of John being in the word of God and eating up the word of God and having just a life of prayer and having just a life of building a community that was small and that nobody saw. Just by digesting the word of God over time, John was able to recognize Jesus when nobody else did. And so what I want to say to you, when, when sometimes when we teach or open scriptures, or if I make, share about a connection, some people are like, I, I don't know that, I don't, I don't know enough. But can I just share this from the bottom of my heart? We study the word of God, or we read the word of God, to encounter the God of the word. Don't be intimidated that, oh, I don't know that. You don't have to know every single and memorize every single thing. You just have to rejoice that in the five verses that you read today, man, God spoke to me in there. I've encountered the living God in the two verses, in the verse, the chapter I was reading. I want you all to be encouraged. It's about meeting the God of the word and not about how many things you've memorized. Does that make sense? No, we read because we want to encounter him. We don't read to be impressed with information. We read so we can see the revelation of Jesus in what we're reading. We're meant to be driven to the God of the word, okay? So let's, let's all be, just relax a little bit. Sometimes we can come to church, I'll never know this. Well, hang around long enough. That's my story. Okay, so now this is what he says, but he drops the term bridegroom. Okay, now bridegroom is a term, and I'm going to give you the, the backdrop in a second. But here's the thing. So not only did he call Jesus the lamb, but now he calls him the bridegroom. Bridegroom is a term in Israel that had only ever been associated with God. Let me say it again. It had only been ever associated with God when it came to the nation. So when John is saying he's the bridegroom, what John is saying is that man right there, He's divine. He is God in the flesh. Again, a very, very huge statement. I'm glad you guys feel the way of it. That's awesome. All right. But why, why is this term bridegroom so, so important? And what I want to do, I'm going to ask my, my volunteers if they, they would kind of come up and hang out here for just a second. And as they're doing that, see, the story of bridegroom, the fact that John calls Jesus the lamb and the bridegroom, they're not two arbitrary terms but the two terms tell a story, and they tell the story of Israel. Okay? So let's give it the context so we can appreciate it, and then we're going to do a little illustration. So in the story of Israel, as you know, they weren't a nation, but they were the Hebrews in the land of Egypt, and they were under the bondage of Pharaoh. 
And Pharaoh's a picture of Satan, he's a picture of sin. But there they were, they were mired in there, being treated in a very hostile manner. And the Lord says, hey, he sends plagues, he sends miracles through his servant Moses, right? Help me out, we're going to talk back and forth. We're telling a story, we're telling a story. Okay, thank you, I heard it from back there. So he sends plagues and all this, and the Pharaoh's like, no. And finally the Lord says, hey, there's coming a moment, the angel of death is going to sweep through. But if you sacrifice a lamb, an unblemished lamb, and you put the blood of that lamb on the doorpost of your house, and you eat that lamb, and you take him in, right? Then when the angel of death comes, when he sees the blood, he will pass over the house. In other words, death won't touch you. And so that death comes through the land, and Pharaoh says, well, everyone loses their firstborn male who doesn't have that, that blood, right? And he says, you guys can go. And so they're like, praise God, we are free. But then as they get a little bit away, Pharaoh goes, ah, I've changed my mind. Everybody on the horses. And so they're pursuing. And now the Israelites are beginning to run. And the chariots of the mightiest army on the earth are chasing them down. And the only thing that's keeping the chariots from the Hebrews is this, this cloud by day and this pillar of fire by night. And they're pinned against the Red Sea. And obviously the Lord parts the Red Sea. And they come through. And the waters, which are life to the Israelites, become death to the Egyptians. Now everyone goes on and on about that, right? That, that everyone talks and they concentrate on that. Nobody really focuses on what happens next. Because as awesome as the, the, the death and, and surviving death is, and as awesome as walking through the Red Sea, the next part in the story is the best part of the story. They meet God at a mountain called Mount Sinai. God shows up, puts his chest out, and is like, whoa, check me out. In other words, God did all of that for, the, for Israel to bring them what? To himself. I want you to meet me. Ladies, if a guy did that for you, how many of you be like, I want to meet that guy? Like, he saved me. He got me out of that condition, and even he parted waters, brought me through a miracle, and then drowned everybody that was chasing me, all the haters, all the guys that wanted me to, you know, just be with him. And no, you'd be like, I want to meet this guy. Amen. He's got a little bit of, you know, like, yeah, all right. So I, I want to show you that encounter for just a second. Again, we're going to understand this term bridegroom, right? This is... This is God meeting them. This is after all that. Exodus 19, verses 16 through 20. It says, Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp, they trembled. So picture this. They're like coming out shaking. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with what? Oh, no, come on, folks, stop reading it in black and white. Start thinking about it. Moses is like, come meet the one who saved you. Come meet the one who delivered you. Come meet the one who's heard your cry. Come meet the one who's faithful to his promises. Come meet the one who loves you before you were even in bondage. Come meet your creator. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. They're like, this is good enough. Now, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. So picture it. And the whole mountain was quaking greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by the voice. So people are hearing the voice of God. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. So God comes down. And my whole point that I'm making here is that while the deliverance and the lamb and the Red Sea was good, now they get the pinnacle moment. The pinnacle moment is that they get to encounter God. All right, so let's keep that in the back of our mind. Now, what begins to unfold at Mount Sinai next is, you know, many will know the Ten Commandments, right? There's ten? Yeah, there's ten. All right, you go. The Ten Commandments unfolds. In other words, God's saying, I love you. Here's, here's I'm, I'm giving myself to you. Here's the requirements, but we're going to break this down just a little bit, okay? So let's have a little analogy, if you will. Let's be a little illustrative, if you will. So Andre, oh, it's so great to see you. You guys just happened to be up here, so thank you. Come on up. All right, so Janelle, you come over here. And these two are married in real life, which makes this really, really good. Okay, right? You got, was, yeah. yeah, okay, sorry, yeah, 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 thank you. Anyway. All right, so Andre is the Lord, right? 
Now don't run with that when you go home, all right? That's just, it's illustrative only. It's illustrative only. I know you were the man in college and all. Yeah, okay. No, I'm just kidding. I'm playing with you. All right. Um, Andre's the Lord. And so think of him, his presence is on the mountain. And now Janelle is going to be Israel. In fact, Janelle is now getting her name in this moment because before it was the Hebrews and other nations or other people groups have come out. But now all of you together become the nation of Israel. The Lord gives a name to you. But what happens is we have the Ten Commandments in this moment. Everybody with me on the Ten Commandments? This is a picture of an ancient Jewish ceremony. And I want to give this to you so we can appreciate. Remember, we want to understand what it means for Jesus to be called the bridegroom, right? So this is an ancient Jewish ceremony. And during an ancient Jewish uh, ceremony, some things have changed through the years, but the, the nuts and bolts are still the same. You would have a, a covenant, and this covenant would be written out. It would be a wedding agreement, a marriage agreement. And in the marriage agreement is everything the groom is going to do. I'm going to supply. I'm going to make sure that you have a home to live in under a roof. I'm going to go build it and make it. Here, because I am receiving you from your father's home, you've been a part of your father's home. You're a valuable contributor. So when I take you from the home to be my wife, I'm going to make a payment, not because you're property, but what I'm saying is I recognize, Dad, that I've taken a valuable contributor from your home, and so here's a blessing signifying that I know what I've done. So now you come to be with me, and I'm with you. I pay this price. And then on top of all this, this covenant agreement, here's everything I'm going to do. Here's everything you're going to do. This is the Ten Commandments. Are you with me? The Ten Commandments is a wedding covenant with Israel. I am going to be God. I will keep you. I will bless you. I will give you land. You will dwell in it. I will be your God. You will be my people. My presence will be in the midst of you. But hey, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay? You're not going to take my name in vain. You know, don't covet your neighbor's wife, all this type of stuff, right? It's, it's a whole covenantal agreement. So that, that's what would happen in the ceremony. So the, the thing I want to establish here, Mount Sinai is a moment, and then you got the smoke billowing up. So you got like this whole canopy under which you bring your bride. Why? Because there is a moment of betrothal. Now, in the Jewish wedding uh, uh, scenario, the ceremony, when they're betrothed to each other, it's not like we do it here in the States. In the States, I gave my wife a ring. Now we're engaged. The betrothal in the Jewish concept, you are married at the moment of the betrothal. In the Jewish ceremony, this is just the first part. So now you pay a price and, here we go, you put the ring on it. But you don't get to live together yet, even though you're companions right now. Now, the groom goes away for a period of time. Why? Because he's building onto his dad's house. And he can't go back and get his wife until his dad said, this is adequate. But in the meantime, she is completely and wholly his wife. And this right here is a reminder that a price was paid and that she is completely his spouse. So she lives, though she's not with him, daily she lives as if she's with him. All right? So, okay, that's the whole concept of betrothal. So come back here, Andre, for a second. So when the Lord is called the bridegroom of Israel, the Lord is saying that this is what God wanted. He wanted a companion. Just like with Adam and Eve, it's the, whole, it's the same story, right? I want companionship, I want fellowship, and this is what I desire, and I'm not just the lamb who was slain. It's not just about the lamb, it's about the fact that you get me. Now picture all of this in Jesus. So when John says this is the bridegroom of Israel, what he's saying is that this is the God of Mount Sinai who gave himself, and why is this important to us? Because when Jesus comes, Jesus does not pay a money price, Jesus is both the lamb and the bridegroom. Meaning he lays down his life and spills his blood. Why? Because it's a nice thing to do? No, because he wants a companion. Folks, the cross for all of us is Jesus' traumatic, profound, most loving statement. I want a companion and I'm willing to pay whatever price is necessary to get you. 
And I break every word over every child, every person who grew up hearing, you're not wanted. I'm here to tell you, let the reality that God has spoken through his son let you know that you are wanted and loved and desired to the point of the shedding of blood. So he did this for us, but he's not just the lamb that was slain. You see, we forget the beauty and the wonder of Christianity. I want to give you our first statement for today. Israel, it's not just that I parted the Red Sea, right? It's not just that I opened up, be impressed by all that. But all of that is just an expression of what? You get me. You see, the miracle of Christianity, here it is, ready? We get God. We get the Lord. I thank God my sins are forgiven. I thank God for everything he delivered me from. That's awesome. But that's not where I stop. I turn around and go, but I get him. I get Jesus. I get God. How? How? Because when the groom paid the price, he also gave what? The bride. This is a sign that it's all been paid for. This right here is a reminder that I'm going to do everything in the marriage agreement. You can take me at my word. You see... At Sinai, it was the law. If it was a regular wedding ceremony, it would be, okay, I've got it written on paper, but what is it for you and me? What is the sign that he's going to do it, that he's going to honor his word? I've given you the Holy Spirit as the wedding ring that's letting you know that I'm going to do everything that I said that I'm going to do. Why? I want a companion. I've created you to what? To be inhabited, what? By me. And so even though I'm not physically with you, I've given you the Holy Spirit because I will reside in you until the day that you see me, what? Face to face and we will live together. But I'm already living in you. And my living in you is a statement about the future that one day we will live together. Are you with me? Okay. So, as we look at this analogy, Jesus is the bridegroom is a statement that you and I, we get him. But it's also a statement that we're desired. He's not just the lamb. He's a husband who, though he has gone away to prepare a place, everything he's doing is with the understanding, I'm getting a companion forever, and I'm in my companion, and one day my companion is going to be with me. That's the reality by which he's operating. Okay? So what does this tell us? If Jesus is the bridegroom, here's the second thing we want to know. We are still in the first part of the marriage ceremony. Meaning that we live today, life. My life as a believer... The moment I said yes to Jesus, I'm betrothed to God, and I've got the Holy Spirit living inside of me, which lets me know he's my reward, and he inhabits me because one day we will share the same habitation place. We good? Man, we're desired. Man, isn't that awesome? But now check this out. Israel could not be faithful. In fact, let me, let me give you a scripture here. So I'm giving you the whole picture here. This is the ceremony. This is the price that Jesus was willing to pay. Okay? Now, so the miracles we get, God, we're in the first part of the marriage ceremony. Let me give you a third statement. We'll put it back up in a second. But what does this tell us? Why do we have the Holy Spirit? It's because we are to daily prioritize living with him. I'll give it context more in a moment. Jeremiah 31, this is the Lord speaking as a husband. He says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a, everybody with me? Though I was a what? Husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. This is husband language. We can put that third point back up. I'm going to give them the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will write my word and my image and my identity across their mind and across their heart. Why? Because I'm a husband who's going to create the means by which my bride can be faithful. 
So we are to daily prioritize living with God. Well, what does that mean? John's life is a great example. John grew up in Israel, and for decades he had Roman perversion, Roman gods all around. He had political games going on with, with religion. And John's like, that's okay. I'm just going to grow and look like God right here in the wilderness. I'm good. Why? Because I know who's mine, and I know who I belong to him, right? So why is this important? You and I live in the day-to-day. -day. We've been given. Again, thank you, Janelle. Janelle's rock is on display today, right? You and I have been given the Holy Spirit, which means that today we prioritize living for the Lord. Meaning every day I'm thinking about, I'm, in already in a I'm already married. I'm not trying God out. God lives in me and I'm his, which means that every day my daily action is in light of this reality that I have with him, right? Okay. So that being said, how many know in marriage that day by day you, you have a decision that you make every day to do everything in light of the fact that you live with your spouse? Or at least you should, right? Some people are like, you got to tell that to my spouse. <laughs> How many know that in marriage, sometimes there's wonderful moments, but then there's just the everyday, I love you for who you are. Meaning there's some great romantic moments, but marriage does not exist on romantic moments alone. And all the married couple said, Amen. meaning you've got to love the person for who they are. God has revealed himself on the cross. He's revealed who he really is. And by dying on the cross and being raised and giving us a spirit, he wants to be loved for who he is in addition to what he does. And we can have high moments with God. We can have moments where he provides super blessing. But how many know that you cannot live a relationship or a marriage on hype alone? There's just the steady, every day, I love you for who you are, and that has been revealed to me, and that's enough. And I thank God for all the great moments that happen, because they do happen. Now, why am I sharing all this? We've got to live daily. We've got to prioritize it daily. Why? Because we live, we live in a fallen world. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and there are a lot of things that will try and catch our attention, that will try to appeal to us. There are other lovers that will try to show up and want us to betroth ourselves to them, even though we're already married. See, but if you have the Holy Spirit, just like John the Baptist in the wilderness, it doesn't matter what other gods there are of the age. The God of me, the God of sexual perversion, the God of political and power grabs and me and narcissism and all that. Though that God may dance around you, you can say, not today, Satan, right? <laughs> Why? I've got the Holy Spirit through Jesus and he inhabits me so I don't care what you have to offer. That one died for me, bled for me. He has put life inside of me. What can you offer me? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Who do you think you're trying to flirt with? Come on, Netflix, I know you want to try and be my God, but I already binged already on Jesus. I don't need. Is it getting darker and darker and darker outside? Yes. Come on, Amazon Prime. Now you want me to pay more for no commercials to see the same garbage I saw before. I just don't. Come on, political party, not upholding your word, dilly-dallying with the truth, parading around like you can offer real power, wanting my attention. Yes, I'll participate in the process, but I don't worship you. I worship the Lamb of God. And I'm, whatever I do, I'm going to filter through him and not by how much you dance for me and entertain me and do your little thing for me. I belong to him. You see, we live in a culture that says... Hear me, when it comes to marriage, that you constantly have to be entertained. That you constantly have to be made to feel incredible. And that's why I said, how many know that real marriage, there's a real beauty to it, but there's a day in and day out rhythm that you need to work at and develop. And you do it because what, I love you for who you are. And I know that you want me and I want you. And what we're building is so much more beautiful than anything around us. 
Is this how we relate to God? Because let me share with you something. This is what God is redeeming right now across the earth when it comes to his church. No, 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 let me check this out. God is redeeming a church that doesn't want to be entertained and stimulated all the time. It recognizes I can find him in his word and he will have a message for me. And just one message from the one who will come and speak to me and come and be with me one day, just one word from him can set the course of my life for the next three months. I, I don't need to be entertained or because I've gone, and I'm sorry, this is all make-believe, remember this. You see, when you live with other lovers who reproduce death, then you come to God and be like, you've got to fix this. You've got to fix this. And so then your approach to God and your approach to church becomes, can you do something that just stimulates me and, and, and relieves all of the stuff I got from them? But after we're done, I want the benefits of you, but I don't want to live with you. I'm going to go back to my other lovers, and then I'll come back again saying, I'm dying. I'm, it's hurting. It's so forth. And we've got this cycle by which it's transactional. God is not a prostitute. God is not someone just to try to make you feel good, right? This is a marriage. God put a ring on it with the Holy Spirit and he's given power inside of you to break every stronghold, to break everything that you think has life because he's holy, he's good, he's righteous, he has life and life more abundantly. Right? And so therefore, we just build a rhythm with a life. Because even though he's not here physically, he's inside you. We know that one day he will be. But here's the deal. This is how we interact with him. Recently, in, in the years past, uh, my wife and I have had a chance to travel overseas and so forth. And Israel, and I had a chance to pop out to Saudi Arabia and all of that. But when that happens, at times I've traveled and she's been home. And she'll tell me, like I'll get a message on the way to the airport, I miss you already. There's just something about being gone. I'm like, wow, this is awesome. All right. <laughs> Driver, turn the car around. Turn the car around now. <laughs> no. But then she'll send stuff like, she's like, are you up? And I'm like, it's three in the morning. <laughs> I was asleep. She's like, but she's looking like, oh, did, did Chris send a text message? I just want to see. Just, just says like, hey, honey, I love you. Thinking about you. Have a great day. And I'm like seven hours ahead of her. And the other times she's like, oh, I, I'm going to FaceTime him. She, hey, how are you doing? I'm like, hon, it's one in the morning. She goes, I just wanted to hear you. I just wanted to talk with you. How's it going? All this. It's really great, but I'm getting up at five. So could you please, you know, like, I love you. But, and the whole point is that she'll share with me, I miss you. Right? And what she's doing, I, can you just send a text message? I know that you'll be home again at some point, but just between now and then, I love it when you say, hey, love you. Hey, uh, my day is going like this just a little bit. Or hey, God showed me something today. Can't wait to share it with you, right? And the whole point is this. A, a spouse will look forward to what, I know you're coming, but in the meantime, if I can just get a sentence from you. Jesus. One day I know that you'll be here. One day this stuff will be settled. But in between now and then, can you send me a text message? When I'm in the text, could you just... I just, if it's in one verse, if it's in two verse, if I'm three chapters in, can you just, man, yo, he loves me. He found me. What? How did he know? Oh, my goodness. He really does talk through the book. Wayne, we were hanging out. Man, I've just been having a rough time. What do you mean? You had a scripture for me? You were praying and you had a scripture for me? What is that scripture? How did you know? I didn't. It's just that your husband sent you a message. No, guys, don't get weirded out by this. This is just an illustration. This doesn't make us effeminate, all right? <laughs> sent me a message. That's right. But we got a whole love letter written to us. While he inhabits us, 
which is a picture of a future habitation together. And so we're able to live faithful in the midst of what the darkness of this world, even while it tries to dance around and say, hey, take me for a spin. You can say, no, I've got all the life I need right here. It's called the Holy Spirit. And I'm living a life. And I daily prioritize it knowing that some days there'll be incredible moments. And other days, it's just the beauty of the mundane, day in and day out, faithful living unto the Lord. Have we received God's word here today? Come on, amen. Come on, stand to our feet. Stand to our feet. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. Jamal and Wayne, thank you for both services. <laughs> Let's bow our heads. Father, just thank you. We bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for this man, John the Baptist. Thank you, Lord, for his life that just speaks so incredibly about this life we live as believers. Lord, that he saw things about you long before anyone else did. To call you lamb and to call you bridegroom. Father, I thank you that you long to reveal things about yourself to us. And we don't have to be a, a, a theologian. We don't have to be the sharpest pencil in the drawer. You just need someone who's just willing to say, Lord, would you, would you come talk with me? Would you give me a message in your text? May I find you among your people. Lord, I thank you that you are the bridegroom. You still burn with that same passion. It's the passion that led you to the cross. It's the passion that caused your blood to be shed and redeem us. Lord, it's, it's the passion that brought about the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts. It's the passion of a husband, a the bridegroom. Oh, Jesus, would you, Lord, move in our hearts again to see you this way and to begin to relate to you this way, just to live daily in the rhythm, the moments of, Lord, reading your word, even when we're tired or thinking about the scriptures when we're tired, just in the same way that we interact with a spouse or maybe a family member when we're tired, but to know that there's a beauty in the rhythm of that relationship. And there are great moments, certainly. But, Lord, you're building something in our lives. Just begin to thank the Lord right now for loving you so extraordinarily. Come on, just begin to make it personal. Jesus, thank you for loving me in this way. Thank you for desiring me in this way. Thank you that you desire me as your companion. Lord, would you, Lord, we thank you for the lamb that was slain. But, Father, may we become even more captured because of that lamb with the bridegroom who desires a companion. And, Lord, even as you created the earth and Adam and Eve, and when you rested, you rested with them. That you desire to rest in your people, not just through the presence of the Holy Spirit, but there is a day coming where you will live with your people forever. So we bless you. Just with heads bowed, I just know that there's people here. I just know that online and in this room that you, you needed to hear today that you, by yourself and who you are, are desired. Some of you have gone years with the pain of rejection, with the pain of feeling second class and second rate and behind. And I'm here to tell you that you are loved just as deeply as every other human being on this planet by the Lord. He could not love you at a higher level. I know some of you need to return to the Lord today and some of you need to give yourself to him for the first time. So if that's you, I want you to pray with me right now. You don't even wait. Just say, Jesus, thank you that you are the lamb slain who bled for me that my sins could be washed away. You are the Lord who rose from the dead and because you're alive, now so am I. Come make your home in me. I choose to follow you. From this day, I get you. And you get me. In Jesus' name. 
Now, while heads are bowed, if you just prayed with me, then you just believed upon Jesus. The Bible says you've experienced salvation, forgiveness of sins, right standing with God. The Holy Spirit now lives inside of you. And you know you needed to pray with me while heads are bowed. And you're saying, Pastor, thank you so much. I needed to do that. I'll give you to the count of three to put your hand in the air, have a moment with God. But you don't have to wait until I get to three. So come on, how many? One, Pastor, that was me. Yeah, I was praying. Yep, 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 I'm watching. Yep. Two, Pastor, yep, that was me. Three. Amen, 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 amen. You can put your hands down. Church, let's look up. Come on, let's put our hands together. Yeah. Come on, bless the Lord in his house. Bless the Lord in his house. He's good. He is good. I want you to be reminded. Look, I, I've been a pastor for a minute. And I've been around ministry for a minute. I, how many know that if you were here, I, I could be excitable, right? I can laugh. I can, and I'm excited about the Lord. But if all you ever heard was, from me was, we're so excited, we're so excited, we're so excited, we're so excited. How many know that after a while you can't sustain that? There are exciting moments with God, but there's just the regular every day that he also loves. And so know that you're seen in the every day, and know that the every day, when it's not, he's in that too. And he wants to speak to you in those moments too. So I want you to anticipate as you leave this building that in the every day you're seen, in the every day you're desired, and you have a companion who knows how to get a message to you because you are his and he is yours. Father, we bless you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. We say amen, amen, amen. Go in the grace of God. If you'd like prayer after service, our prayer partners will be up here. God bless you.